formats as we go through the Encuentro of these tertulias. And this one, we're, we're, we're trying to have more of a group conversation. So if you feel so compelled, you want to join the conversation, we'll be closer. Please feel free. There's a couple of extra empty seats. Otherwise, stay where you are. People will be coming in later for shows that are, are getting out. People will feel free to leave. This is very casual, right? It's all very about casual. conversation. Very and if you're here and then you just like to leave, it's okay too. Yeah, that's we'll okay. We'll all wash your head. <laughs> Good job. Thanks. So I'm just the hype man here. So I'm here to get, get our energies up. I just want to ask a question because I've seen quite a few of your faces at the events, right? So I just want to kind of get a sense. Who's seen what? What's been surprising? Do you have anything you want to share with us today about anything you've seen over the last two weeks? Any hands? Okay, right from here. As somebody, I, I don't speak Spanish. As somebody coming into the theater experience, um, uh, like walking into a show, with a language I don't know and being able to follow like attention and stuff like that, I've noticed like there's such it's a lot easier than, than what I thought it would be. Uh, language is a really big scary thing for me. Uh, um, and I've really appreciated uh, the craft and I can really see it and notice it uh, without knowing what the words are, the intentions are still there. And mm -hmm. it's something that's really nice and it's something that affects me really, really deep. Mm -hmm. and it that's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Did that maybe inspire anybody else to share anything else they've seen or felt as they've encountered any of the plays? Something that's been really striking to me is going into the lobby and hearing all of the conversations about maybe why this show or why that show, and that's been really fascinating to hear. And so I just want to really encourage us as we go through this panel uh, moderated by Daniel to really feel empowered to ask questions and to challenge each other as we go through this. this is ongoing conversation, and so even if you're up in these seats, you can still talk and participate with us, yeah, okay? Like hey, Alex, I'll say something. Yes! Uh, having, like, one again, been around a lot of the festivals in the old days, but having a lot of them as artists, is that we, because we do our work long, we get less exclusive. I, I really want to applaud everybody here at the Los Angeles Theater Center for the, and everybody who's all of the whole organization. Uh, of the inclusive nature of the Holy Encuentro, not just uh, culturally, but also in terms of age-wise. It's great to see you know, the next generation of artistas, as well as the veteranos and everybody in between. So I think that I think that's something that's remarkable and uh, very, uh, should be recognized. Thank you. I think that's Tiffany and Jorge and Chantal work very hard to make this space as welcoming as possible. So if you need a place to talk about the work, want to be in a little bit quieter zone than upstairs while the music playing, please, please come join us in the vault. We also want to share the Latino Theater Commons as one of the uh, partners in this festival. We're producing all of these Encuentro, I'm sorry, all of these Tertulia events, which are also being live streamed. So if you want to tweet along and join the conversation, please, hashtag Cafe Onda, hashtag New Play, hashtag Encuentro 2014. I'll be following all of those. If you're a little shy about maybe asking your questions or want to get want to repeat some words back, I also want to share that up in two weeks during the final weekend of this encuentro, we'll be having a national convening of Latino Theater Commons. This convening is completely open to everybody who's interested and wants to attend. All you have to do is buy tickets at the LATC box office. Okay, so if you have questions about those kinds of events, they're all in your program. They're all listed there. And they're all for people who are interested in Latino theater as artists, advocates, scholars, administrators, and we welcome you all. Okay, without any further ado, I'll give you Daniel Vaquez. <laughs> Entonces, 
coléricos nos desposeyeron, nos arrebataron lo que habíamos atesorado, la palabra, que es el arca de la memoria. And then, in rage, they dispossessed us, they snatched away the thing we had most treasured, the word, which is the vessel for memory, or the vessel of memories. So I thought that was so appropriate, no? Because uh, we're talking about doing theater in Spanish here, but also realizing that Spanish is also a colonizing language in the Americas. Um, so, uh, my name is Daniel Jaques. <laughs> I'm from Mexico. Um, I, I, the show that I brought was Patients Fortitude and Other Antidepressants. Has nothing to, it's not in Spanish. Um, but I do direct a lot in Spanish at the Miracle Theater and a couple of independent companies. Uh, and I'm very passionate about the, the need for this uh, type of theater to be readily available to the communities here. So I'd like to introduce by name, or let's start with Ruben. Ruben Amavisca Murúa, eh, director artístico del eh, Grupo de Teatro Sinergia, Teatro Fuiracalo, Teatrego en general. Nacido en Chicali, Mexicali, México, por lo que no sepan. Um, Grace Dávila, eh, de Puerto Rico. Ah, está hablando español. ¿Por qué fue? I feel like, like, um, René Pérez en calle 13, when he was here last weekend, or two weeks ago for uh, Supersonico, and um, I, as he addressed the public, he said, well, I, I'm not sure how to address you in Spanish or in English, and I think someone later on addressed that and said, well, I don't know, but this is the, the perfect time to learn Spanish if, if, if you don't, but the, is this supposed to be in English? Let's do it in English. Okay, okay, so um, I'm Grace Davila, and um, I'm a professor at Pomona College, and I'm also editor of Gestos, which is a journal related to the to um, Hispanic theater, and um, that's it for now. I'm Anthony Rodriguez. I'm the producing artistic director, the founder and producing artistic director of Aurora Theater and our Spanish language um, division, which is Teatro del Sol. My name is Eva Sanuya Tesler. I'm from Mexico City. Uh, I am associate artistic director of Borderlands Theater, translator, director of Maria Circular Dance, that's playing just up there. Great, welcome. Thank you. It's an honor to have you here. Um, can each of you talk for about five minutes on three minutes, <laughs> ten minutes, you want ten? <laughs> <laughs> on, on, I know uh, what your company does, their mission, uh, is it all in Spanish, uh, who your audience is, the difficulties of producing, uh, or the, the challenges of producing either in, in Spanish or in English, if, if that's kind of the second, yeah. go ahead. Well, first, yes. Same question for everybody. Yeah, we do in Spanish because, well, I'm Mexican. I love my language. And uh, I'm, uh, that's who, who I am. Uh, I don't need authorization to do it. I'll do it. And I, there is a community in Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, we are over 40% Latinos. Mm -hmm. And most of them, uh, a good chunk of them, they speak Spanish. Uh, and especially where the Frida Kahlo here is located, uh, about 90% of the people speak Spanish monolingual. So the recent immigrants, that's how uh, we started. Uh, the company was started by um, uh, Aníbal Aprile, uh, Argentinian, uh, Yvette Cruz, Puerto Rican, Ruben Marincioni, Argentinian, and uh, Jose Salgado, uh, Cuban. In 1987, I joined them in 1988. At the time, they presented all in Spanish. I actually was the one who started bringing bilingual theater into the company. And the reason was because we all have friends or family that were second, third, fourth, fifth, fifth generation, mm -hmm. and they did not feel very comfortable with Spanish anymore, or they were married, living, uh, whatever, with people who did not speak Spanish, and they wanted to come, so we started doing that. And we do all our shows, most of our shows in both languages. Mainly, we get the place in Spanish, even when I write it. I write in Spanish, and then I have my translators, one of them here is Muller, uh, to translate them into, Spanish, into English. Uh, we have a community that uh, likes it, craves it, and comes and see it. Most of our performances in Spanish have a more audience than the ones in English. Mm -hmm. uh, we are better known for Spanish theater. Uh, usually we do, let's 
say, four weeks on the community work. And that, because that's our uh, community. Uh, our theater not, not only houses Grupo de Teatro Sinergia, but also uh, collaborates with other organizations, uh, the organizations that present exclusively in Spanish, like Taller, Acabal, Catalecos, Quetristas, uh, I'm forgetting one, Acerrin. Uh, so most of the audience that goes to our theater, they go to Spanish and Spanish. And Spanish. Uh, so that's the work we do. And um, the challenge, sometimes it's challenging to do more avant-garde uh, fair because our community is more, much more conservative in that in those regards. Uh, also, sometimes it's hard to get actors that are trained actors and who speak Spanish fluently. Sometimes we have to sacrifice and uh, somebody criticized me once because I used an actor who was a Mexican play a Mexican part. I don't give a flying fuck about it. <laughs> <laughs> I have worked with uh, pretty much every nationality. Even if we had a lady who uh, was Hungarian, a uh, Filipino lady, a Korean guy, uh, as long as they are committed to the theater, as long as they, they, they do the work, I don't care. Uh, but so, sometimes it's difficult, and sometimes, like I said, I, I've done plays that, uh, like Stabat Mater, we got the best reviews ever for, the, uh, for that play, but I knew that it was not going to sell the place. And it, it did not. And it was a wonderful play, we had wonderful reviews, a pick of the week for LA Weekly, LA Times, um, Backstage West, but very few people. It was, very, it was different from what our audience used to. So I have to be very careful to balance sometimes my uh, ambitions with uh, the, the box office. Because uh, more than about 70% of our income comes from uh, box office. So I have to be very careful and I have to bring seat, uh, people in, into the theater, otherwise I have to close. That's a very good reason for que en español. Yes. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, like I said, um, my name is Grace Davila, and um, I identify myself more like a, uh, as a teacher of Spanish language and literature. Um, when they asked me to be in this table, I think I tried to to you know bail out and say no, no, I'm gonna be there, but I'm gonna be sitting on the other side. <laughs> I'm gonna be a theater maker. And um, definitely, uh, for me, it's a mystery how, you know, I open the newspaper or uh, I receive an email telling me there's a play in Spanish, and then I have to decide if I travel from Orange County to, you know, uh, Los Angeles to watch it. So, so for me, the, the, the process of how a company uh, chooses a play, decides to produce it in Spanish, um, uh, and, and, you know, simply getting to the theater and, and to see a play that usually is not producing, uh, it's not, it wasn't written by um, a, 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 a someone from California or a Latino. Um, so I really thought I was gonna come here to ask the questions, not to, not to talk about a company, which I don't have. But I, I do want to say that um, uh, for me, as a Spanish uh, professor, um, language has always been very important. I mean, uh, I also, I, I'm also Puerto Rican, and um, in Puerto Rico, I think language and, and maintaining Spanish is a, a question of honor. You know, it's very closely linked to our identity. So even though I've been living here in the U.S. for 30 years, I think um, I um, decided to study Latin American theater because I saw it as a way of understanding something beyond my Puerto Rican identity, my connections with other people that spoke Spanish. So when I moved here to the U.S. Um, and I taught Spanish, I really thought that um, uh, I really identify with um, the plays that I see in Spanish. Now, one problem is that most of the plays that I see in Spanish here in, in California usually come with a festival, mm -hmm. like like um, it's happening now that we have a chance to see Marisol in El Desierto or um, uh, Agua Pucharada, which is some, you know, the place that we will be watching in Spanish come in, in the framework of, of a festival. Or they come um, in, 
to, they're doing a tour in the U.S. and they're from Chile or Argentina. Uh, so uh, at the time in which I have to choose place to bring my students, usually they are places that come from Latin America. Seldom do I have the opportunity of, of, of bringing my students to see a play in Spanish that was written by a, a, a Latino author or even a, a Latin American that wrote a play in Spanish here in the U.S. So, um, but you know, it, you know it, like he was saying, uh, or, or he was saying that they produce one Spanish play a year, and, and you. Don't take my whole five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> with them and so I wanted to do something that would help me reconnect and since I had the resources of the theater and other people's money to use I thought I would do that. Um, so it was only going to be one show a year and at first I was uh, very ambitious I felt like I, I should do it bilingually. That takes a lot more rehearsal than I had actually scheduled which would in turn take much more money because it's two plays you're rehearsing. Um, and it wasn't working. It, I didn't feel like uh, producing the, sh the same show in both languages was really getting what I wanted out of it or what the audience wanted out of it. Um, the English ones were very, very poorly attended. The Spanish ones were better attended. So I felt like I really wanted to specifically target the shows to my Latino community, which is very diverse. It's Mexican, it's Puerto Rican, it's Dominican, it's Cuban. And so I wanted to choose those things. I also wanted to make sure that every time we cast the show, it was as diverse as possible within that. That the people that we were using 
like we're doing a play by Karen Zacarias, and it's directed by Paula Grievous, so those are the two Mexicans involved. <laughs> and then no one in the cast is Mexican, <laughs> even though it's only about Mexicans. Um, wow. Right. <laughs> <laughs> But in one, in one Jewish American. So, so we wanted to make sure that, that we were doing that because I don't know if y'all know, sometimes even amongst ourselves we're a little discriminatory, right? So I wanted to, yeah. You know, the Argentinians all think they're better than all. And the Cubans think they're better than all. Well, yeah, so you know how it is. So I wanted to help build those bridges. Right amongst our amongst ourselves, and so that's that's what we did. Um, and then I was invited to serve on the steering committee of the Latino Theater Commons, and my entire world changed. I did not, you know, I would use my staff to design the shows, all American, right? Um, and so we were missing some key ingredients. And when I started to meet new playwrights, new designers, new scholars. I had all of a sudden broadened my network of people that I knew. And so Mariela and El Desierto, which is here, um, we have a, a much larger group of Latinos involved in producing it. Um, I realized during um, our meeting in Boston that because I have the position I have, I'm in a place and I have a responsibility, at least I feel I have the responsibility, to hire more of my people because I can. Um, and so I should. And so that's what we're doing. It's a great, it's a great evolution. Like it's you starting it because you felt you wanted your personal connection to your culture, and now you're bringing in Latino designers. Well, when we when we separated out, when we first got to LTC, they separated us out, and they said, "Okay, all the playwrights be over here, all the artistic directors go." Go self segregate to where you know what you what you align yourself with, and this group of artistic directors was fairly small. And if you then sort of separated out the ones that did just Latino theater, I was in a very tiny group of people that run an organization in America that that has Latino theater that, that um, and is a Latino right uh, that heads it up. So I felt that's when I was like, I have a larger responsibility, and um, so now I. Take that very seriously. You're delivering. Thank you. Try. <laughs> More Class Theater is 30 years old next year. <laughs> so we've been, I've been with the company for 20 of those. Um, we have been doing plays in Spanish, in Spanglish, uh, in Spanish and English. And we have not only done that, but we also have connections with the Circulo Teatral in Mexico City. So, uh, for example, Maria Circular Dance, which is performed here in English by the translation by me, is also being performed in Mexico with uh, the, in the original Spanish. Uh, so, um, our, we, we've done the Lorca plays in Spanish and English. We even did Fuente Ovejuna by Lopez de Vega with a bunch of Chicanos <laughs> in El Siglo de Oro Festival in El Paso. That was something. <laughs> Anyways, so uh, we are very committed with uh, working in, with uh, other theaters in Mexico because that's our border mission. That's the mission of Borderlands Theater too. Destroy borders, and I want to um, take this opportunity just to ask for a moment of silence for the 43 students who have disappeared in Mexico, and also for the end of the narco estado. Question, and then I'll throw it, let you guys 
fun. Um, Ruben and everybody, you said, I'll work with whoever wants to put in the work, right? And, and now I want to bring uh, actors and tell the story with as many as a diverse people in, in, the, um, in my community. So, um, the story, the story is written in Mexico, the story is written in, in Ciudad Juarez. How do you deal, how do you, uh, how do I put this lightly, accents, getting people out of work. I, I work a lot in also in Portland, Oregon, so my job to directing theater in Spanish is about community engagement and training Spanish-speaking actors. Uh, but I never actually did even consider doing dialect work, for example, with, a, with, a, with my Spanish-speaking actors. Because I thought that was like really not important. Um, but in, a, in a, an encuentro this big, some conversations have come up. So what is your position? Do you consider that an important issue? Your thoughts on that? Accent? No. I mean, we try to neutralize, actually, for example, uh, the, when we did Frida, the, the lady who originated the part was Puerto Rican. They just try to flatten the accent because we don't want to, uh, Frida Kahlo, she said, Ojo, 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 Ojo. I had that problem with my accent. But the, uh, The mother and the uh, women of Juarez is, uh, is, uh, is uh, from the Dominican Republic. Oh. Uh, now, the one to place now is, is Chicana, totally mm -hmm. from Texas. Wow. Uh, but uh, that we try to neutralize the accent sometimes with more success. Yes, the same thing, we don't try to do okay, we're doing an Argentinian play. Uh, because first, you have the problem with uh, the time. You have only six weeks. That's all equity allows you to rehearse. Six weeks. We can rehearse only four, four days a week at our theater. Uh, because we, have all the, we don't have a rehearsal space. It's only one space. Also, um, if you work in LA, you know how difficult sometimes it is. Uh, actors have auditions, have this, this, and to get the cast together, sometimes you, you can even get them for press rehearsal. So uh, it's kind of hard. Uh, and to do that kind of work with the accent, it, it requires a lot of time. So we just try to neutralize it and we work with actors that might have a heavier accent. But that's the, the thing. And I don't find it contentious at all. It's, uh, it, I've seen plays where the I can notice some accents that don't belong to the character. Well, I understand. It is, uh, unless, of course, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, Major things that I cannot understand. The actor that speaks, right. but it, the, the the whole thing is like I do have an accent in English. I don't know if you have noticed it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, as long I, as I understand, well, one of my examples, Maria Wira, wonderful actress, uh, Hungarian. I love her. Uh, she's sensational, but uh, she has a very thick. Eastern European accent. But you understand everything she says mm -hmm. when she's on stage. And that's what I ask, that's the only thing I ask for the actor. Either you do it in English or Spanish as long as I understand. Sometimes it's kind of challenging, but if it would be it would be easy, we wouldn't we would do, wouldn't do it. I mean we we'll like the challenge, we'll do it in theater. It's not easy to do it, and there is no money in it. So uh, for me, it's not a contentious issue at all. Uh, what sometimes it is, is when we start talking about aesthetics. And that's one of the points of the, uh, yes. the, the conversation. First of all, who's aesthetics? And that's all of my question. Who's aesthetics? Who's, who's uh, saying, because if you want me to follow the pattern of the, uh, let's say it, I'm not being racist, but yes, I am. White, <laughs> white American theater, like some scholar that I know, Fuck the American theater. <laughs> uh, you we know, are the American Yeah, exactly. We are the American theater, but oh, those are the patterns dictated by some people in the university, whatever. No, that doesn't work for my community. I do a theater for my community. So either you spell out what you mean by aesthetics, 
because I've seen beautiful shows, very well uh, designed, illumination, whatever. But at the end, they're empty. There's nothing. And I don't want that in a theater. When I want, uh, I go to a theater, I want to be moved. I want to have an emotional, um, uh, intellectual experience. If I, if, if I want to just enjoy a nice looking thing, I stay home and watch TV. I don't care if it's not uh, beautiful. What I care is that it moves me, makes me think, makes me angry. That's the experience I want in theater. That's the experience I want for my audience. That when they come from the show, the worst thing you can tell me about any of my shows is that they are bonitos. Que bonito. I just saw he uh, he directed uh, the Women of Juarez. At the and Rodin, please. And Rodin. And Rodin. And Rodin. And Rodin. And Rodin. And Rodin. But the comment was about, it was also beautiful. So it's not exclusive. And you also had moments of, of uh, sharp aesthetic, uh, sharp uh, visual aesthetic, uh, uh, but connected also to the heart of the character and the story. So I don't think, I think aesthetics is defined as... W well, uh, that, that yeah. that's, that's always been my question. Define it for me. No. Uh, the, uh, well, the, the way it's been uh, presented many times. Mm. It's like, okay, what are, who's there? And what are the rules to follow this? For me, the rule is pretty much, okay, what are you trying to say? That's it. For me, that's the most important thing in theater. And that's the most important thing I ask for my actors. What are you trying to say? Rule number one. If you have nothing to say, leave the stage. Sometimes, somebody once, uh, regarding the meetings we were uh, doing last year, Say, oh, well, depending who's involved, I'll participate. If there are these groups that are frivolous, like, well, who are you? What's your background? How's your, okay. These people are trying to do theater. They're serving a community. And as a matter of fact, I started in some of those groups. Some of us evolved, some of us stayed in, in that, at that level. For me, for, they have the passion and they bring the community to the theater. For me, that's, that's what's important. Mm -hmm. But mainly when I choose a play or when I'm working with an actor, it's what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. more, much more important to me than how it's going to be presented. Yeah. Well. <laughs> <laughs> so we have this, basically the same thing. We, we try to flatten out the accents as much as possible because our audience is very, very diverse. And so, so we want that, and it, and it is, it is problematic. We only rehearse for, for three weeks, no. so um, we don't have a lot of time to do that. Um, and we try and just you know, we gave it the flavor. And we'll um, so not contentious. Not contentious. Are you as strict with your English productions as you are with the productions in Spanish? What do you mean? Like, uh, for example, do you require southern accents for Tennessee Williams and not for... I don't present Tennessee Williams. I was actually... You know what the director's vision is. You can do it like him, okay? It's not like the guy. You know, it's interesting ways of speaking. I was talking about the... Lope de Vega in uh, El Chamisal, and uh, there were some critics there saying that Chicanos can't really have the mastery of the Spanish language mm -hmm. to bring a Siglo de Oro play to fruition. And, and I thought that it is interesting that uh, we have these hierarchies of languages. I think all languages and all formal languages have the same level, and Spanglish is not necessarily inferior to Castilian Spanish or to English. <laughs> because remember, Spanish is a mixture of Arabic and Latin and what else? I don't know what else. Uh, brought by the soldiers when we we're driving themselves into Spain. Yeah, you know. It is, it is not pure. There is nothing pure about languages. Not English, not in Spanish, not in Spanglish. They are all mixtures and they are all 
the hierarchy comes because there is a cla class and social hierarchy that's established with the language. So um, we have that problem in Arizona with the only English instruction. And we, we will fight against that tooth and nail. How do I do that? Uh, I try to produce plays in Spanish. Right? Because that is the way that I can do it. And that's, that's what our voices in, in theater is saying. This is our culture. This language is, is as good as any other language. And our expression is as valid and as beautiful as anything else in this country. Yeah, I just want to say that when I hear these uh, expressions with neutralized accents, um, you know, um, humbly speaking, it, it worries me because you watch Univision and, and you see that they try to neutralize the accents and not that they really can do the, the, that deeply. But I think one of the most beautiful things in our language is the different languages we, we have, the, the different ways in which we pronounce things. I was just going to say that one of my favorite groups in Latin America, Malayeva, he's Argentinian, she's from Spain, the guys, in, the other ones are from Ecuador, and, and you know, they make the, the things work. Um, but does what it means when I go and, and watch a play uh, that is um, like a classic and there's somebody that is Argentinian, somebody that is Cuban doing something, to, and, and I really wonder, and this is a question I think uh, for those of you who do theater, um, is it possible not to neutralize the accents, but like you were saying, to try to uh, either cast people that can, uh, you know, so that there's a, a, a rhythm, you know, a, a rhythm, a, even though the accents may be a little different, that, you know, it doesn't seem like there are two countries doing the, the part. Is, is that, is, do you say it's difficult? Because it takes a lot of time, but can, can it be done? I mean, or do you want I to do that? I think so. I mean, it's challenging, okay. uh, but to, to find the actors that have the talent, the passion, that are right for the story that you decide to tell, you know, the play that you decide to tell. Well, mainly, like, uh, I, I try to take, they, they pronounce at least all the consonants. Because, <laughs> <laughs> uh, or sometimes I like, say the rhythms, the rhythms. Because uh, it, sometimes it, it, is, it is important. I, like, salió un cojones, por ahí, no me molesta, no? But, uh, yeah, like I said, and uh, they, when I, somebody took my script of Frida and did it at UCLA, a student, and uh, I didn't find out until there was a protest by the students, the Chicano students at UCLA, because the guy cast uh, an American actor play Frida, and she was saying something like, Tiago Rivera, and they were pissed about it, and I would be pissed too. Okay, at least we learned to pronounce the, the freaking name. Uh, but in general, it's, we try uh, as much as possible. We have an actress that will mention her name that she cannot say Ciudad, but we still do it uh, working with her. Hey, Some my money, okay? because one of the actors was Guatemalan, uh, two were Guatemalan, uh, two were Mexican, uh, one was Chicano, uh, one was Argentinian. So I, I would, we try to, uh, to keep the, the language, but it's difficult if, for example, you are doing a play, and like I, again, I said, Frida, Frida, Tadeo, and Chico, it's going to be distracting. <laughs> so we try to tell, okay, uh, I'm not, uh, because most of the theater I do, again, because I'm Mexican, most of the theater I, I do is, uh, comes from Mexico, and because also most of our audience are Mexican. Uh, of course, if I were in New York, I would be more inclined to uh, find places in, in, to the Puerto Rican community, Dominican community. I'm trying to serve a community. Here, most of our uh, community uh, is, is uh, Mexican-American. And for that reason, we try to do it that way. 
I haven't found or, or, or the place. Maybe I don't have the access. But maybe once in a while I get a Chilean play or Argentinian play. But mostly because I go to Mexico every year, I see plays, I talk to directors, actors, and they send me material. That's how I find it. Um, there's a lot of uh, playwrights that write in Spanish here in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, you decided to translate yours into English. You decided to translate a, an English play by a Latino uh, writer into Spanish. Karen. No, she did that. I, oh, <laughs> right, 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 right. Um, why go that route? It was a great play. Here's the, uh, and, and partly why Mariela worked for us so much better. We, we're going to have to have English supertitles if I want even part of my audience, my English speaking audience to come. And, and some of them come because their you know, husband or wife is American and they don't speak Spanish, but the, the wife does still want to come or the husband does come. And so you need a, a play that, that works very well in both of them that has that already available. I don't necessarily have the staff or the staff time to translate the whole thing myself. Although we did do that with, with play a few years back, and that was a train wreck. Uh, <laughs> but, and I, I believe I'm right that she did her own translation. She may have mm -hmm. had some yeah, sure. with her father. With her father. But we had one before that that we'd done that was translated by several people, and it was it was a mess, and we had to go back in and fix the super titles. And we were like, that's not anything like what we we're saying, and they don't always match up. So we still have to go back in and fix things as we go. And Sergio does a great job of that, my stage manager, um, of helping to, to fix that. So that it, they can follow along the same way. We don't want people to get the joke before we've said the joke. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole, there's, super titles are a whole other art that we've sort of over the years gotten better at when do we hit the button. So that we do that, how do we, how do we keep people from following the actor if they've gone, you know, to Cleveland in the middle of the show, and they're not—they're not the same place. If the if the super title person starts to follow them, then we just tell them to slow down, wait for the actor to, to find a place where they they recover, <laughs> and, and let's figure out. For us, uh, we try in three different locations to do Spanish and English simultaneously at certain point, or with the super title, and uh, and El uh, Vagón. Uh, the, all the immigrants spoke uh, Spanish and the immigration officers English. And in the sale, she spoke English, sometimes a little bit Spanish, and he spoke only Spanish, sometimes a little bit of English. Those the less successful shows with the audience. They didn't like it, they got confused, they, they were bothered by the super titles. And I, so you don't use them. We, I, it, was for a, it was a kind of an experiment. So I thought, well, if they are in America, and these people are crossing the border, talking about El Vagón, the immigrants, one of them should t say that he had been here before, so he can speak a few words, but not the whole play, and the, the uh, immigration officers, they spoke a few words in Spanish, but mostly in English. And El Deseo, she's an American uh, uh, teacher, and he is a Colombian uh, guy, a student. So we try to, okay, only Spanish and only English for her and this for title. Mm, it didn't work for us at all. Uh, we've never done like a whole performance in Spanish with subtitles or vice versa. We've never done it. But when we try to mix both, our audience did. We also did a deseo in, in, in Tucson. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did that, the same thing, uh, uh, the female character picks up a sex toy in Colombia who doesn't speak a word of English. And so uh, the sex toy always speaks Spanish. The, the, the boy toy? The boy, the boy toy. toy. <laughs> and, the, and the woman only speaks English. And that is, they understand themselves in bed very well, but they do not understand themselves when they talk. And so that was at the center, that became the center of the dramatic conflict. So the audience went along with it. They, the, the audience couldn't understand some words here and there, but because it was in the center of the dramatic conflict, it worked really well. And as the play progresses, 
the male character starts to speak English more and she starts to speak Spanish and understand. They understand themselves better and that means the end of their relationship. <laughs> it was a success, we presented it two years in a row. What I, want, what I wanted to say about translation, when I go to an opera, sometimes there is no super title, and I don't really care to understand everything that they say, but I know the plot because it is written down in the program, and I listen to the music of the language, and I think our audiences can learn to listen to the music of the Spanish language. I go to Shakespeare and I understand half of it. <laughs> I'm being a Mexican, I really don't understand it. But I understand what's going on, and I, I love the music of the language. I don't have to understand every single word, and I think that the audiences, if they sit down, sit back and relax and listen and hear the music of the language, they will come to enjoy El Orca, they will come to enjoy El Lope de Vega, uh, just like we do when we go to an opera and we cannot understand Italian or German. So that's my opinion. There is a El Orca that has a show here. They just premiered their bilingual version. So the scenes in Puerto Rico were in Spanish, the scenes were in English, and it enriched everything so much just because the way they staged it is like uh, simultaneous scenes happening, and if everything was in English, you'd have to struggle to define where they were. But now with the two, two languages, it just kind of frees your mind to really get into the character. So it depends. Some need subtitles, some not. Some need bilingual, some not. Um, I'm going to, before I throw it to the audience, uh, talk, uh, Jose Eduardo Torres Tama would sneak in a quote. Uh, that it is important to present theater in Spanish even if your audience is only English speaking because of the subconscious subversive act of breaking the monolingual paradigm of a conquering empire. All right. <laughs> so, do you guys have any questions for? to give up one of the languages, I mean, uh, one of the most wonderful things uh, when I uh, went to uh, Belgium and did, uh, did a show of mine there, most people speak uh, two, three languages. Uh, by the time they're uh, five, six years old, I found tons of people there who spoke Spanish. 
Uh, as I'm walking in the middle of Antwerp and I find a mariachi. <laughs> and, 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 so it's, it's just uh, the same in France and Poland. Mo most people spoke at least two languages. If not, uh, you go to Germany and they, they, you have three, four, it enriches everybody. Uh, so, and when, like you were saying, yes, when I go and see a show, I, have, I try to be that open sometimes. It's like, uh, I try to find out what is the company, what is the play about, and I do some reading before I go to the show. Unfortunately, not everybody has that uh, luxury or desire. But, Ines, you had a question? Yeah, just as a bilingual actress and a translator, um, I've come across um, being handed scripts or reading, you know, I'm in Juarez, so I was reading books on Juarez, and Something that really upsets me is that I find things that are published that are riddled with mistakes, grammatical, um, orthographia, acento, everything. And I feel like that's something very different in the English language that things don't go to publish with that many mistakes. You don't go to publish something with homonyms and, and um, tenses wrong or names, um, like typos in names and things like this. And it was really upsetting to me that, you know, I, I get scripts and I almost have to second guess myself, like, hold up a second, am I saying, have, have I been saying this wrong my whole life? No, it's actually just they conjugated that verb wrong in the script. And um, so I'm just wondering if you encounter this, because I feel like oh. most of you, um, like, either already got like, the published training for the play or whatever, but if you do encounter it, um, how do you deal with that and kind of what's your take on on that issue that I feel like is, is a big issue with especially things published in Spanish in yes. the U.S. that are held to a lower standard than things in English. I correct my friends on Facebook, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so they write in Spanish. Uh, I, I worked in newspapers and I was a proofreader, corrector, uh, from a very young age. And so yeah, I understand and sometimes it drives me nuts. But uh, especially when I see it in newspapers, I will mention the name of Neon. Uh, <laughs> huge, huge misspellings, and like you say, misconjugations, and you say, or syntax, and so like, but I'm sorry, uh, I cannot do much about it. Uh, that's it. You know, it's a, uh, that's a whole other can of worms, you know, uh, because language is also evolving slowly. Um, and there's pockets of different cultures in Latin America that approach things differently. Um, but I think, I think the, for organizations to be responsible to actually, you know, if it is Spanish, Spanish, you know, ask a Spanish translator to make sure it's correct and things like that. I mean, we are guilty of it. The por qué no en español. It should have been por qué instead of por qué. So uh, it's just, uh, in the rush of doing all the stuff and putting it all together, we think it's correct. Um, but we do need a little bit more vigilance on that. Yeah, okay. so, yeah, so, please. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, there's this other thing. Um, when do you translate in, from Spanish to English and you leave some words that are untranslatable? Mm -hmm. And when do you go all the way and, and make it sound like it comes from Ohio? <laughs> You know, what, what, how do you choose to do that? I, that is something that I grapple with every day that I do translation. For example, in Maria, there is some idiomatic thing <coughs> like agale, which I don't know that that can be translated into English ever. I don't know what that is. I understand what it is in Spanish. Or, estas son mamadas. translated into English very well, so I leave it. Like when you go to a building and you uh, are doing restoration of the building and you leave some tape, some pieces of the, what's underneath to show what it is underneath. That's what I think. But then I am working with another translation, which is uh, Caridad speech translation for La Ocente. And that is translated in such a way that you cannot tell that these people are not in New York City or in Los Angeles or in Texas, and it is supposed to be Mexico City. All the references have been wiped. I mean, that she was, she, 
had that choice. She made that choice. And, and it all of a sudden became something universal. So that is something that I, I don't know if you have ever. Oh, yes. I mean, the, the closing line of Mujeres de Juárez in the first act, there was no way we could translate it. Chinga tu madre, pinche policía culero. There is no way we can, we, we can translate it, so we left it that way. And somebody asked, because we tried many things, and uh, my translator suffered when I, uh, when I presented a new play, because I used a lot of idiomatic things that I've learned growing up, and soldaderas trying to recreate the language of my grandparents. Uh, so they're images that they don't know, and I have to sit with the actors, explain to them so they can do it. But certain things, yes, you cannot translate. There is no way you can translate. I thought I was interested in the Maria Circular Dance, but I think you left a lot of the, some of the Colombian words that were back in the Soviet theater, but it was very good in that way. see and 
they, that's what they expect. Sometimes you try to challenge them, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But I understand, but like the BFS, really, yeah. they have a 996 here, so what happens, if I do it in the little year, of course, you know, you do a round of six weeks, that's 2,000 people, you know. And one of these years, you do a round, you need 2,000 yeah. people every week. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, it just, so that's what I'm talking about, it's a little diff difficult. I, I don't know how, you know, uh, this is good for, I'm, I'm fascinated by the went through how the brands are going. Mm -hmm. Too bad that everybody saved for, for a month. Mm -hmm. you, you know, because I see how the tickets are evolving, the ticket sales, because it's a lot of uh, word of mouth. Mm -hmm. it, you know, so which is interesting to me because I think Mariela was picking up, you know, yeah, the ticket sells, but I was here, so I really, really would pick up, and, and I wanted to see, you know, it, 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 it's hard to do a round of four weeks in a theater that is like a city. And, and unfortunately, I'm trying to, trying to figure out how, I think Spanish is beautiful, and I think, and, and I would love to see this in Spanish, the more, we have to figure it out. But who are the people attending the festival? not the audience that comes to the theater. It's, it's artists, it's friends, it's no, actors. That's what I'm saying here. It would be beautiful to get audience from the community to come to the Encuentro, yeah. to come to see the plays here. It's interesting because my, the, the audience who's coming to see the Encuentro is the Latino theater company artists yeah. who are mostly industry. Mm -hmm. And you know, we send them to Mariela on the first night because we were not getting a lot of traction because it was in Spanish, and they loved it. And they told their friends, you know, of course you have super titles, but yeah, it, it, it's really less here people coming to the way of the There's a lot of bigger areas that are Jorge, in here, in here. Okay. Yeah, I want you to know that the reason we then looked at us and we said, fuck the American. We are not the American theater. He was quoting me at one of our Latino theater. I said, sounded like you were Jack. That was a terrible moment anyway. I would say, fuck the scholars. After the martinis. Okay, so the question is what fascinates me whenever I tell people that the Atrala Cora, the Atrala Sol, is in Atlanta, Georgia, doing beautiful. Professional Spanish language theater. We can't get an audience in this theater. Okay, so how do you do it? Where do those people come from? The Spanish audience. Yeah. So the way we we've, we've grown our theater is the same way we've tried to grow this the Death of the Soul program. And for us, it's all about uh, personal engagement and our community. And the more that we get out, the more that we we get to know the people that are in our community that speak Spanish, the better off we are. Sergio does an amazing job of doing that. Um, I, I work with the Georgia Hispanic Chamber of Commerce to get to know more people. Um, and and it's, it's all about knowing some people that will then tell some people that will come. Now, granted, we only do it in an 80-seat house. We don't do it in a 500-seat house. Um, so we don't have to fill a bajillion seats. But it's, it's a continuous process. We have to continue to, to talk to that, that community and to, to bring them in. Some of them are scared. And sometimes we give away a bunch of tickets. I mean, it's not, you know, it, it, it's a labor of love. It's not one that I know is going to, to pay for itself over and over again. So I'm not worried about that. I want to build the audience. I believe we're doing something important. And so we're willing to invest in it to make it happen. <laughs> When we opened uh, Frida in uh, 93, I mean, uh, I could rent it here only for four weeks because I had no more money. I, I did it with my own money. The first uh, day, we had probably about 30 people, mostly friends and family. And this is the time before Frida was popular in the United States. Uh, the next day, we have a little bit more. On Sunday, we had almost a full house. It was 60 seats. And then the following three weeks, packed every night. Packed every night.
time. And we've been doing this show for the past 20 years. Uh, the same happened with Mujeres de Juarez. When we opened, the first, we all, what we do the, off, the first weekend, we offer tickets uh, $10 uh, or two for one. So people come and see it and generate, uh, I mean, some bucks. And that's the first time we did it. I mean, we had some people because they were taking uh, advantage of the $10 tickets. But then people started coming and filling up the house. And we did it straight 27 weeks, four performances a week, packed houses. The same happened with Malinche. It's just that for us, that's what's been uh, the, the audience. They come, see it, they talk about it, and bring their friends. And Frida and Mujeres de Juarez and Malinche, I heard so many people, oh, I've seen it four times. I brought my aunt, I brought my, my mom, I brought my uh, sisters, my girlfriend. They keep coming, bringing new people because I cannot afford publicity. Uh, so for us, it's that, that our audience, they like the product and they talk about it and they bring more people. We Eva? get, our, we get our, uh, our Spanish audience from the Spanish students of the University of Arizona. Spanish classes from the University of Arizona, we'll support by them. But uh, we don't get a lot of our community Spanish, they don't go to our theater. Yeah, okay. Can we just, yeah, yeah, go over there. Spanish was her second language anyway, 
and then she had to put a German accent on top. <laughs> and there's another play in Mexico that's pretty well known called Las Mujeres que Viven Vodka, and it's about Polish women who came to try and break into the TV industry during the Second World War. That's why the reputation, you know, the, the TV, all these blondes all the time. Well, they happened to be Eastern European, but the actresses in Tucson had to play the roles in, when we did a reading of it and give them some Polish accents. But that, and I think that same blend occurs in this country, but we don't hear it very much in Spanish. But I bet if you were really had playwrights that looked at the, the complexity of immigration within the Latino community in this country, you'd find the same textures. Is that right? Question? Well, actually, just a, a suggestion. Um, Maika Espinosa, uh, who graduated from the MFA in acting at UC San Diego, uh, uh, <laughs> just published a book, Monologues for Latina and Latino Actors. Mm -hmm. and she teaches speech, and she learned in our program that every actor should learn the international phonetic alphabet. Mm -hmm. And if you study that, and it's not easy, you can begin. I don't know how many of you work with actors who have studied the IPA, but she has a lot of hints in there. And she So there are sources, but they're limited, and it's a whole, it's a very important field that we need our actors to learn how much to um, do. Before we move, uh, there's uh, a lot of theater in Spanish in town. Uh, there was about 10 years ago when there were only like two or three books doing it. Fortunately, in the last four or five years, a lot of new books have come out. And uh, I know I work with them a lot. Uh, that I know directly, there are 10 groups that were constantly doing theater in Spanish in Los Angeles. And so if anybody <coughs> wants uh, to know, get in touch with them, you can shoot me I'm on Facebook and I'm on uh, Twitter, uh, or if you just go to our website, riachalotheater.org, there's always, always something going on in the Spanish theater in Los Angeles. Uh, so, uh, Let's go and see it, let's go and support it, not only the Spanish, but in all theater in general, but in this case, because again, yeah, I'm Mexican and it's my, my language, and I, I recommend it. Thank you. Uh, I think we can end with that.